These stitches are the first things you need to learn if you want to make a bespoke suit. Understanding and being able to do the stitches will make following all of my future videos, all my future content, much more easy. For this video, you will need needles, normal sewing thread, and basting thread. We need a few 20 by 20 centimeter squares of cloth as well in order to make them the way I did. I've tried to make this as simple as possible, so yes, all you need to do is cut about, well, let's just say a few 20 by 10 to 20 centimeter squares of any particular cloth. It can be calico, like I said, and it would also be better if we had lining for two of the samples, but if you can't, that's fine. If you have any questions, leave a comment and I'll get to it or you can PM me on Instagram. We hold the needle around the middle with our thumb and forefinger of our dominant hand. We wear our thimble on the middle finger of the same hand. We can use our thimbled middle finger to lever and direct the point of the needle. We can use our other hand to help with positioning the needle and cloth together, but we mostly move the needle to meet the cloth. When the point is where we want to start the stitch and is touching the cloth, we'll use our thimble, our middle finger, to push the needle through the cloth. As we push the needle through the cloth, we completely let go with our thumb and forefinger, continuing to push the needle through with the thimble. We re-grasp the needle with our thumb and forefinger, still pushing it to pull the stitch through. With the needle free of the cloth, we grip the thread with our other fingers and pull the thread all the way. We loop our little finger underneath the thread to give it a small amount of tension. We aren't pulling the thread tight, we almost never do that, just enough to set the stitch neatly. And with some practice, or a lot of practice, this should become one fluid movement. Proper technique is important to maintain speed and comfort as you sew. You'll see that I almost always hold the needle in the same way, no matter the stitch. Every stitch I make, I'm positioning the needle in the same way, sending the needle through the cloth and pulling the stitch through. It's always the same. You should also be able to create a knot in the end of the thread to keep it from pulling through. You might not always want to use a knot, but when you do, the fastest method is to trap the end of the thread around your forefinger and loop the thread once or twice around said finger. Use your thumb to roll the coil off of your finger and pull the loose end tight. It is something you need to practice more than you might expect to consistently get a good knot though. Plus, with this method, so long as the other end of the thread is moored somewhere, it's easy to do this knot with just one hand. A basting stitch is used to temporarily hold together two pieces of cloth or to hold a seam in place before we sew it down. I want you to baste two pieces of fabric together as though you were joining a seam. Baste the two together approximately one centimeter from the raw edges. The basting stitch is practically just a running stitch. We can make a knot and send the needle through both pieces of cloth and make a stitch about a centimeter wide going maybe two centimeters and making another one centimeter stitch through the cloth. The most simple stitch ever, made easier by the fact that they're quite wide. Do this all the way along one edge of our fabrics. To finish stitching at the end, we can tack the thread Tacking is making the same stitch in the same place two or three times so that it is held in place basically by friction, I think. We can also use this method to fasten thread to start instead of a knot. It is more subtle than a knot. It won't create a bulky mass of thread anywhere. Now fold one of the pieces of cloth over the stitching. Fold it over the stitching and push it over the seam allowances. We'll start another basting stitch near the seam on the folded side of the cloth, cloths, basting through all four layers, doing just the same stitch again. Doing any stitch 
like this on cloth in this context of how they're being held together is a top stitch or an edge stitch. You've practiced the basting stitch twice now and you also know what's up when we get to basting things for a fitting. The mark stitch is a way of duplicating chalk markings from one layer of fabric to another, mirroring it. It is sewn with doubled up basting thread rather than a single strand. So place two pieces of fabric on top of one another again. Chalk align five centimeters up from one raw edge. We will mark stitch this line onto the other layer of cloth. Don't knot our thread. This one is a short stitch underneath and a long stitch on the top or a long stitch and a small gap. It's always a short stitch underneath, but the density of these, like how many we make on the line, is based on what we are mark stitching. We snip the thread between each stitch, leaving the small amount of thread bridging the two layers of fabric. The two layers of cloth are gently parted and you will cut the threads parting the fabric, leaving identical lines on both pieces. Now I want you to fold the cloth upwards along these mark stitch lines as though they are hems. Practice the basting stitch along the two pieces of cloth near the bottom where the folded edge is. A slip stitch is a diagonal stitch that is used when basting and normal sewing to hold things in place. It holds things more firmly than a regular stitch because it holds a larger surface area. To begin, we can knot our basting thread or we can tack. We will start at the top of the folded up edge of our cloth. It depends on how we feel comfortable holding the needle and cloth for this stitch but how we make this stitch is to send the needle through the cloth at right angles to the direction of stitching. Move along the edge of the cloth and make another stitch coming in the same direction as you started, which creates the diagonal line between stitches. Just keep going along the top edge. All of my stitches are coming from the same direction, be that the top, bottom, left or right. This stitch can also be used across two folded edges of cloth, such as when we sew the double welts of pockets together. Once we get to the end, we can tag the thread again. Do this along the tops of both samples so that we can move on to the next stitches. I use this hem stitch or blanket stitch to stitch up the hems of my trousers. I was taught it by, as far as I'm aware, one of the best trouser makers who uses it on all of her trousers. We can use our normal waxed sewing thread now. We can start this stitch with a knot. On the right hand side of our folded up cloth, we can send the needle underneath our cloth to come out through the folded up side about half a centimetre below the raw edge. Directly above this point, a tiny amount above where the raw edge finishes, we can make a very small stitch in the cloth. Small to the extent that we cannot tell that there's a stitch there on the outside of the cloth. Easier with some fabrics than others. Pull the thread all the way through and we'll have a vertical bar of thread holding the raw edge up in place. 
It's important that you don't pull too tightly. We do not want the stitching to be pulling the folded edge upwards. We will move to the left, as we do with most stitches, along the raw edge by about a centimeter. Send the needle down behind the raw edge and send the needle through the folded up cloth again, like when we started. You could pull the thread through at this point or wait for a second. But either way, again, go directly upwards and make a tiny stitch through the outer cloth, pulling the thread all the way through now. No matter what, we never want to pull too tightly to the point that we're drawing the cloth together as though it were a drawstring. We only ever pull the stitching enough to take out the slack, usually. Rinse and repeat. With this kind of stitch, there's no such thing as too dense, but there is a point of diminishing returns, not to mention the amount of time you spend doing it. This stitch will very effectively hold up a hem and prevent heels and toes from catching the raw edge and pulling on it. To finish this stitch, we can do it in any way that we know. I might suggest to keep in not sewing on the outside to tack on the folded up cloth only. With our final tack, we can send the needle through the loop and pull it taut to tie it off. In this kind of situation, we can also send the needle between the two layers of cloth, making a long stitch coming out of the cloth and pulling the thread tight, cutting the thread right where it comes through the cloth, hiding the tail of the thread. The cross stitch is sewn left to right, or backwards, right to left for left-handed sewers. Begin with anchoring the thread on the inside on the folded up fabric. For the next stitch on the outside piece of fabric, move backward away from the first stitch, but push the needle forwards towards the previous stitch and pull the thread through. You will then move back to the other side, moving away from the previous stitch, pushing the needle towards the previous stitch. Pull the thread taut, but not, but not tight between each stitch. I don't want the stitches to be pulling towards each other. I'm gonna stop hiking on this soon, promise. Depending on the context on what we're sewing, we might only want to take a tiny stitch through the cloth behind. What's unique to this stitch is that when it's pulled, the thread tightens and locks together. I'm not quite sure what significance that has, but you know, it's good to know. To end this one, when you were on the inside of the hem, just anchor it again on the folded up side. Mark two centimeters above the folded edge on either of our previous two samples. We can use some lining fabric or we can just use the same as our other cloth and we want to fold that upwards about two centimeters. 
Line the folded up edge of our lining to the 2 centimeter mark we made. Line the folded up edge of our lining to the 2 centimeter mark we made. Line them up so that the sides with the folded up raw edges are facing each other. I would usually refer to this as wrong side to wrong side because we are putting the sides of the cloth that we don't want visible when we finish together and our usual intent is to hide, cover, or wrap raw edges. We will base down the folded edge, fastening it nice and straight. With our sewing thread now, secure the thread underneath the lining, or lining as appropriate, only just underneath the folded edge of said lining, only sewing through the layer of the main cloth that is folded up on top. From underneath the lining, send the needle through the very edge of the fold of the lining on top. Pull the thread through. Go back into the main fabric, not through both layers, exactly where the stitch came out of the lining. Then come out three to five millimeters along the edge of the lining and take the smallest practical amount of the lining exactly where you came out of the main fabric. Go back into the main fabric and keep going along like that until you're ready to finish. We need to pull this stitch tight enough that the small amount of exposed stitching is as unobtrusive as possible, that it's not overly exposed. Also that the stitching is hidden between each stitch but doesn't pull on the previous stitch, that it's almost relaxed between the stitches, that there's, that there's no stress at least. To finish, go through the lining one last time, stitch through the main fabric, but when you come up again, don't catch the lining this time. Move it out of the way to tack the thread, preferably hidden underneath the lining. Once again, we can hide the tail of the thread between two layers of cloth. That's the fell stitch in its most common use, but an important use is along the hem of the jacket. Like before, fold up some lining and place it inside to inside with the cross stitch fabric, or the hem stitched if you already use that, the other one. But when basting, do the basting stitch two centimeters or so above the folded edge of the lining. The lining below the base can then be moved upwards, and instead of felling the bottom of the fold, we are felling it above there. Start, finish, and do the stitch in the same way. But importantly, you are still only catching the one layer of lining and one layer of the main fabric. It's done this way so that the lining is dangling and has a few centimeters of movement and won't pull the main body of the jacket up. You'll see it on almost every jacket and overcoat. With my thumb here, I can feel that I'm not catching the outside of the lining.
When I remove the basting, you can see that because it's ironed, the lining wants to stay folded, but I can pull it upwards and it'll sort of balance, I guess. There's movement in there. For the anti-gravity stitch, lay two pieces of your cloth together. You will start by basting your lapel along the line that your lapel will fold on, which we call the break line. So we can chalk an angled line on one of the corners of our square. The bottom of where the break line hits the edge of the cloth is, will be the break point. Mold the thread on the top fabric without catching the other piece. Once it's tacked to the top layer, you will keep your finger on the other side of the fabric so that you know when you've gone through in order to only take the smallest amount of the outside fabric as possible. Stitch upwards parallel to the break line you drew with the fabric flat for now. Keeping the direction keeping the direction of the needle perpendicular to the angle of the lapel. The distance between each stitch can vary to suit preferences. Less dense is functional, but the more dense, the better held together the layers of cloth and canvas will be. This is comparable to the slip stitch, except we only want to stitch through a very small amount of the cloth underneath to the extent that we ideally can't see the thread only a pinprick, or better, a dimple where the thread is holding the cloth. When you get to the top, you will go back halfway down your most recent stitch and thread from the base side to the outside, same as before. From the second row, we will curve the cloth over our hand. This is shaping the cloth. It promotes the lapel roll on the chest and the collar when we get to that. Each row is staggered to the last, otherwise you end up with lines of pock marks. When we get to the bottom, it's the same thing to change direction halfway up the last stitch you made. When you inevitably run out of thread, which I'm just sort of doing a demonstration rather than running out of thread here, stitch in the same spot, only through the top layer of fabric. Take some more thread and tack the thread where the next stitch would be in the same fashion and then continue like nothing happened. Easy enough. It's very important that we tack and we don't knot the thread when we're padding the when we're padding anything because we don't want the bumps on the collar or the chest at all. When stitching you want to pull on the top fabric slightly as you're sewing it for the same reason as that you have it folded over your hand. This gives it shape by having less fabric on the inside resulting in that side pulling the outside manifesting in a curve. When you're done, and if it's done right, the outside of the fabric should be pockmarked at regular intervals and be both satisfying to touch and look at. It takes practice, and as you start, you should very frequently check the stitch before committing to it so that you know you've only caught a very small amount of the fabric.